Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia, and I'm also currently a Danish Diabetes and Endocrine Academy visiting professor at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. The idea behind Inside Exercise is for you to get your exercise information from the research experts. So your information on exercise physiology, exercise metabolism, and exercise and health. And what I'm really wanting is for you to get your information from the experts rather than from influencers. And indeed, today I bring to you Professor Jose Calbert from the University of Las Palmas de Gran in the Canary Islands. He is an absolute authority on what limits VO2 max. So VO2 max is your maximum oxygen consumption during exercise. And it's known that VO2 max is very important for endurance performance. So we talk about what limits VO2 max and also the role of VO2 max in endurance performance talk about sex differences, effects of age, etc. And we also talk about how VO2 max isn't just important for endurance performance, but is very important for longevity. I found it really interesting. I think you will too, so stick around. Hi, Jose. How are you doing? Welcome to Inside Exercise. So I'm doing well. Uh, th thank you for inviting me to your podcast. It's an honor That's to share this panel of the scientists. I don't know how often you are broadcasting your your interviews, but uh, but they are quite interesting. Thank you. Well, I try and average one a week. So I've averaged one a week since we started. I think you're going to be number 67 since June 2022. So I think we're on track. Um, yeah, so this is interesting. Where it's, it's, I'm in the University of Copenhagen, as you know, at the moment, um, a visiting professor. And I think you're the third in a row um, that have ha has a University of Copenhagen link, which we'll get to. Um yeah. And we'll talk about that. But what I like to do to start off, so we're going to talk about the limits to VO2 max, which is very interesting. So, um, you know, what determines VO2 max? What limits VO2 max? What's the importance of VO2 max and exercise performance and all sorts of things? Um, but before we do that, I'd like to talk to you about how you ended up doing this sort of research. I know you're a medical doctor, um, but I'm interested, were you like a sports person initially and, and you know, interested in exercise? And then you started doing medicine and then PhD or how did you end up where you're at now? So, so you know, it's, uh, my, my father was a medical doctor, so I had an influence in the family uh, about medicine and so on, but I like it a lot sports. So when I wanted to start medicine, uh, there was a selection process, so I needed to have a very good grades and so on. I didn't know if I would get a position. And I like sports, so the, the positions were open earlier at the sports uh, faculty. So then I started uh, sports science in Barcelona. And after one month into the studies of sports science, they told me that I had a position to study medicine in Barcelona. So then my father told me, uh, well, so you can just uh, drop the sports thing and get into the important issue that is medicine. But then I like get exposed too much, and then I got a compromise with him, and I said, "Okay, I'm gonna try to to run both both at the same time, and then if I fail in the first exams in medicine, I will quit sports science." So, so I didn't fail. So then I continued, and uh, and so at the end, both I, at once. Yes, uh, when I was 24, I had the both degrees, and then and then the question was sports medicine and uh, orthopedics, but then, but then I realized that what was interesting me most was physiology. So then I did an internship in, uh, in rheumatology. I'm a rheumatologist. And then I decided to, to, to make in parallel a specialization in sports medicine that I did in Montpellier in France. And then I also did a specialization in Barcelona. So in the end, Again, having both specialities, rheumatology and, and sports medicine. And in 1980, 1990, I applied for a position in the University of Las Palmas because the place was attractive and they had mm -hmm. a good plan for, for putting a new lab, a new faculty. We had money to start up. And then I decided to to take the risk and the venture. And I came here to Las Palmas. I'm very happy I did. And then uh, when I was here after a couple of years, I reached Ben Saltin in a conference in Barcelona and I asked him 
for joining for one year and a half on uh, here we, and then I went to Copenhagen for one year and a half. And then uh, and then the, the relationship with uh, Copenhagen and Bent was every year involved in studies and traveling four, six times every year to Denmark. Six times every year? Four, six times wow. every year. It was spending wow. between, between four and six months every year in Denmark, most of the summer, all summers since mm -hmm. 1990. 2014 were involved or connected to activities in uh, in Copenhagen. Sometimes it was expeditions to to Bolivia or, or yeah. other places. And, so let uh, me just let sorry, just let me clarify. I, I should have said um, that you're in the Canary Islands. So you know, people may not know. I I had to actually you know Google where the Canary Islands were to be honest. And um, so you're. Now, you're based in the Canary Islands, so when you say that was an attractive offer, I don't know about financially or whatever, but it's not. It's quite a nice place to be, I guess. So you're in the Canary Islands, which I'm guessing is not the hub of research, and and you travel to, to Copenhagen, or you did until 2014, six times a year. Yeah, four to six times a year. Yeah. Okay. Every wow. year during, during this period, that was between. Uh, 1997 and 2014, mm -hmm. and in 1994, I was there living permanently until 1996. It sounds like you, you're a smart man in terms of the timing that you go as well. So you go in summer because this, people will know if they listen to the podcast, this is my fourth time I've been in Copenhagen. I always come in summer. So you obviously choose a good time to come. And yeah. and just to clarify what you said, you actually did physical education and medicine at the same time, which is yeah. pretty amazing. And how long did you complete? How long did it take you to do the two degrees? To do it? I, I mean, medicine was six years, and I did it on time. And as far as science, it took me the six years because one year I skipped. I didn't I didn't do anything in sports science because the pressure in medicine was too high. And then I said, okay, but yeah, I'm, I'm not doing anything. Fair sports and the sports science was short, it was five years. And medicine mm -hmm. was wow. six years. So. Which is actually a lot for sports science. So so you actually didn't take any longer than the normal time you take to do medicine. You took the oh. normal time for medicine and you tacked on the sports science, which is a five-year degree, which is intense anyway. So congratulations on that. So I think that was pretty, the fact you got through that was a bit of a predictor of the fact that you were going to go on and become a successful in something, but research is what we saw. Yeah. Okay. And you're actually a rheumatologist, but you never practiced as a rheumatologist. So oh, I did. I mean, I did a residence for years and then, mm -hmm. and then I didn't uh, practice rheumatology, but the education was very interesting for me because I was having internal medicine. I was having also education in, uh, I, I was doing a uh, trauma. Uh, 24 hours uh, room, emergency room work, also emergency mm -hmm. room medicine. And, uh, and all this uh, educated me quite well as a medical doctor. So, and this oh, was, sure. it was very important to, to, to conduct invasive uh, human physiology. And I'm assuming your father was happy in the end with um, your, what you did. Yeah, yeah. That's good. All right, and for people that don't know, um, so you said you you studied uh, your medicine, etc., at the university in Barcelona, and that's Spain, and the Canary Islands is part of Spain. So I had to look that up, even though it's ne next to Morocco and uh, Western yeah. Sahara, so it's a long yeah. way away. All right, so we're going to be talking about limitations to VO two max uh, today. So why don't we talk about that? So obviously that's that's of interest to all sorts of people. Obviously, if they're endurance athletes. But it also, as we'll talk about, even as a predictor for mortality, you know, your VO2 max is an important predictor of, of your uh, longevity, et cetera. So why don't we just start off talking about, you know, what limits, well, what is VO2 max? Why don't we just start off, what is VO2 max? VO2 max is the amount of oxygen that is, um, that is uh, consumed by all the, the mitochondria that are in the, in the body tissues. And, uh, and it depends on two main factors. On one side, it depends on the flow of oxygen. That means the amount of oxygen that is arriving 
to the muscles and the capacity that the muscles have to extract this oxygen and utilize it. So you mm -hmm. cannot have a VO2 max higher than the amount that you are delivering. And the delivery of oxygen to the muscles depends on two main factors. One factor is the capacity of the body to capture oxygen from the atmosphere and transfer this oxygen to the blood. And the second factor that is very important is the capacity of the heart to pump this oxygen and then how this oxygen is distributed between the tissues because the mm -hmm. oxygen has to go where it's needed. And during exercise, where you need more oxygen is in the active muscles in the heart because the heart is also consuming a lot of oxygen during exercise. And then it should also go to the head. You cannot uh, leave the head without proper oxygen delivery. Perfect. All right. So, so during exercise, you have a increase in heart rate, yeah, and also how much you pump per beat. Do you want to just take us through that a little bit? Yeah. So when you do exercise, the cardiac output, that's the amount of blood that the heart pumps every minute, at, that at rest is five liters per minute, is going up in direct proportion to the load. So the higher the intensity of the exercise, the higher the cardiac output. And it would increase in a healthy human that is sedentary, then it's not doing exercise, it would increase in a man to close to 20 liters per minute and about 20% less in a female. Hmm. But in elite athletes, it can go up to 35, 40 liters per minute. But then, then the question is that, how do you achieve this cardiac output? So, so the heart, every time that is contracting, is pumping a small amount of blood that we call a stroke volume. And, and the heart, to, just to, to pump this stroke volume, has to contract. And every time that is contracting, it's consuming oxygen, it's consuming energy. So, so when the heart is working, it also needs oxygen. And the faster the heart is working, the more oxygen it needs. But also the, 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 the oxygen demand of the heart, the amount of energy that the heart needs, is also increasing with the blood pressure. So if you have a higher blood pressure, so the heart has to pump more strongly and then it consumes more energy. So, so when you are doing exercise, the, the amount of energy of the heart is increasing in direct proportion to, to the heart rate. Actually, the heart rate may explain 80% or 75% of the total oxygen demand. And then the other factor will be the work that the heart has to do has to, do to overcome the pressure. And then yep. it's very easy to estimate the demand of energy of the heart using exercise just by calculating a variable that is called double product. That is the systolic blood pressure that is the highest value of the blood arterial pressure within each cardiac cycle times the stroke volume. Perfect. All right, that's great. All right, so so you were talking about, yeah, the, the maximum cardiac output therefore would be your maximum heart rate by your maximum stroke volume, yeah? And then that would be, um, you would also have probably the highest blood pressure. So your, that would be the highest work on the heart as well, right? Yeah, so the, the, it will be uh, heart rate times stroke volume that would be the maximum cardiac output. And then the blood pressure at maximal exercise, very close to the end of the exercise, will be maximum, but in some subjects, it actually declines a little bit when you, just before stopping. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, that, and this is giving us an idea that maybe one of the contributing factors to stop the exercise is the drop of the pumping power that the heart is doing because the blood pressure actually depends on the pumping of blood. Mm -hmm. So the blood pressure, the, the, the heart, when it's pumping, is pushing blood mm -hmm. into the system and is generating pressure. Yes. So, so when, when we do an exercise, if the pressure is starting to drop, there may be two reasons. One is that you have too much vasodilation. That means that the, that the arteries uh, are increasing the diameter too much and the arterioli in the tissues. Or 
that the heart is not generating enough pressure. It's like fatiguing. So, so one of the two things may be going when you have a drop of pressure during exercise. And it's quite important to figure out which is the cause, because if the cause is that the heart is not able to keep the pressure, so this is an indication to, to stop the exercise, because if it's a patient, it may have something going. Oh, okay. This is very interesting. Maybe we'll talk about this later. So just I'm just wanting to yeah talk about the, the limitations to VO2 max. So just say you're an untrained person, yeah? So you start exercise and it's a low intensity, then you can make it harder and harder, like a VO2 max. I think most people know a VO2 max test. So it's a graded exercise test. So it gets harder and harder. And and do you want to just tell us why their VO2 max is not as high as a well-trained person, um, especially as they'll get up to probably the same maximum heart rate, even even maybe higher than the well-trained person? Yeah, the, the elite athletes, they, they have... The, the maximum heart rate is the same as an untrained subject or even a little bit lower. Actually, hmm. they are very good, very well trained. The peak heart oh. rate is slightly lower. Yes. And uh, and then then if the heart rate is slightly lower, how they are able to have those very high uh, cardiac outputs? And the answer is very easy. They have a very high stroke volume. So then, So then the question turns into how is possible for those elitarians to have uh, these high stroke volumes? And and also mm -hmm. know that uh, one of the main reasons is that they have a very big heart. So, and a big heart can fill with more blood. So then when it contracts, it can pump in each bit more blood. So, but this is not the, the only reason. So the, the heart of an elitarian is also able to relax very fast is is able to feel to feel very fast. It, it has a, what is called a very high compliance. It means that the heart is very distensible. It fills easily with blood, and then it's very efficient. So when it's pumping, and 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 it's also pumping at a lower heart rate. So that means that uh, that trained people and the athletes when they are pumping a given stroke volume. Uh, a given uh, cardiac output, the heart rate will be lower. And, and as I said before, if the heart rate is lower, the oxygen demand of the heart is lower. So that means that the heart of the trained athletes is much efficient than the heart of mm. a person that is untrained. It needs Beautiful. less oxygen, the same work. Okay, great. So I've, we've been sort of talking about maximums, but the nice thing you're saying there is if you're doing sub-maximum, so we all know if we go for a jog or something with someone who's fit, they're not huffing and puffing, their heart rate's lower. So that even though they're doing the same work, assuming they have the same body rate, so for example, if you're both exercising at 100 watts or you're both running at the same speed and you have the same weight, you're doing the same work, but they've got a bigger heart so they can pump more blood per beat, so the stroke volume. Yeah. So they don't need as sorry. They both need the same oxygen delivery, so they yes. need the same cardiac output, but they're achieving it with a lower heart rate because their stroke volume is bigger. Is that fair to say? Yeah, but also yeah. also they may they may have also a little bit lower uh, cardiac output if they are able to extract or they use. Uh, mm high extraction because they are able to extract more oxygen. So, mm -hmm. so if, they are, if they are, because some some guys, when they are doing, some trained guys, when they are doing a maximal exercise, so they use this advantage of extracting more and they keep uh, leg blood flow a little bit lower and cardiac output then may be a little bit lower, just a little bit. Yes. All right, so that's sub-maximal. Um, okay, so then we they keep going up. So let's just talk about the, the untrained person first, I guess. Well, I guess it's the same for both of them. But if you just talk about what happens, so you keep going up to max, yeah, and the untrained person is just going to stop earlier and they'll have a lower cardiac output, a lower VO to max. And do, so you want to just take us through what happens there? So then, so then um, the the VO to max will be determined by the cardiac output that will be much lower in the untrained people. And then there is another factor to have into consideration that is the extraction of oxygen. And, and the extraction of oxygen is something that is occurring mostly in the active muscles. And the, the trained people, they are, they are able to extract a higher fraction of oxygen. 
to explain less more easily. So, so there is a concentration of oxygen in the arterial blood. That's the blood that is supplying the tissues. Imagine that the normal one is uh, is uh, 200 milliliters of oxygen per liter of blood in the male. And this is the oxygen that is arriving in the artery. But in the femoral vein, at rest, there is still um, 150 milliliters of oxygen that has been left there, that has not been used. But during exercise, an untrained subject will extract 75%. But an elite athlete, is able to extract 90%, maybe 95%. Mm -hmm. And the highest value I have seen is 97, 98% wow. extraction okay. mm -hmm. in, across, across the leg. So that means that the blood that is arriving to your heart is having a very small amount of oxygen. Yes. So they have a very high capacity to extract oxygen so it's the combination of both factors that 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 allow the, the very high uh, trained elite athlete to have a very high VO2 max. Great. So 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 as you said, the VO2 max is determined by the cardiac outputs, how much oxygen has been delivered to the muscles, right? Times how much oxygen has been delivered, which we we say that it's the arterial venous oxygen difference. So how much has been, as you said delivered by the arteries and then extracted and then comes back in the veins. And you're saying in the at rest, about three quarters of the oxygen that arrives at the muscle then comes back to the heart has not been extracted. Yeah. And then in an untrained person, about three quarters is extracted, but there's still a quarter left right, during maximum exactly. exercise. Exactly. But a well-trained person, it is extracted even more. So that not only do they have a higher cardiac output, so they're delivering more oxygen to the muscle, but they're extracting more as well. And, and you said it can come in at 100% and come out at 97. It's like the, uh, sorry, only 3% left, which is what you said is a, like that, the- That's the in, uh, in, so that's world record, okay? World so record, wow. Yeah, 97% extraction, 98% extraction is world record. It's the highest extraction value I have seen. And this, this has been recently in experiments we have done in Oslo in collaboration with Justin Halen and Evan Scatipo, and also in experiments that we have done recently in Las Palmas yeah, with, uh, with Jamie Barr, in collaboration with Jamie Barr from Guelph and Kyle Thompson. Mm -hmm. So wow. and in both studies, we had very well-trained athletes, and we saw extremely high uh, oxygen extraction. Really in some of them that blood must have been because when i first did some arterial venous so we did femoral artery and femoral vein just to see them sitting next to each other you know the artery is nice pink blood and the yeah. vein is more purple it must have been really purple yeah really um black. yeah yeah it would be black, black almost, yeah you're right almost black when it's coming uh, wow with uh, this level of desaturation that's so cool. Okay, and just to clarify, are you talking about, um, because, you know, we're getting a bit technical here, I guess. I'm talking about femoral artery versus the femoral vein. Are you talking about it was 97% extracted in the femoral vein, or are you talking about when it got back to the heart, the mixed venus? Oh, no, it's, it's at the level of the femoral vein. Yes. At the level okay, of cool. the femoral vein, you have only 3% left. In those, wow. In those record, world record. World value. record. And it's fair to say once it got back to the heart, it wouldn't have been 97, but it still would have been probably 90 or something. It would have been... Yeah, probably very... in, those, in, in this guy going back to the heart, probably it's going to be 90. It would have 8%, would be 7%, 93. So, so systemic extraction will be 92, 93. Most wow. likely. That's super cool. I just got a shiver up my spine. <laughs> I like this stuff. Okay, so we've talked about a few things here. So the cardiac output, so delivery of oxygen, yes. And then the extraction, and you'd mentioned mitochondria, so maybe just talk about that and how, and how, um, how you how you think that it's more the delivery than the extraction that you think is determining the VO two max. Like even in these really well trained people, is that right? Yeah. Is so one thing. One thing is uh, what is happening in the really trained subject, and then is what limits 
what is the li main limiting factor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. So, so we can test the limiting factor by, by increasing that factor and see if the VO2 max goes up. And what we know, what we know is that if we increase delivery in an energy tablet, so we can increase VO2 max. So how can we increase delivery? So we can give pure oxygen to breathe. If we give pure oxygen to breathe, so then the oxygen content of the arterial blood is going up by about 10, 12 percent. And then VO2 max is increased by 8 percent, approximately 9 percent. So that means that that if you increase delivery, you can increase VO2 max. So so then so then in another tablet, if you are able to increase the VO2 max when you increase delivery, it means that the mitochondrial oxidative capacity can also be increased by 8% or 9%. So it's not limiting. Correct. Okay. Then, so then the limiting factor is, is delivery in a very high trained athlete. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have more than they need on mitochondrial extracting capacity. The other, the other question will be, the difference between one guy that is able to extract across the leg 90% and one guy that is able to extract 97%. There, there may be local differences there that explain their situation that are probably peripheral adaptations that develop uh, with uh, long, uh, long uh, training. We have seen those values in people more than 30 that they were doing uh, uh, top level exercise for several years. Sorry, did you say thirty? What did you say then? You, what did you say? They then? were they were more more than thirty years old, and they. Okay. I mean, they were elite athletes that have been performing at very high level during several years. Several. Okay. Okay. Then, then, now, then it turns out what may be different in an elite mm -hmm. athlete that has some experience. Imagine a. Uh, Tour of France uh, uh, competitor that is uh, 32, 33 years old, 34, and is winning. He's, he's becoming the winner. That is not unusual. So he probably is having this level of, of uh, spectacular okay. peripheral mm -hmm. satisfaction. And then the explanation is probably uh, capillarization. They probably have more capillaries, and uh, and they may have also more subsarcoma of mitochondria. So so they may have the same amount of mitochondria, but maybe the mitochondria, they are closer to the capillaries and they have more mitochondria below the sarcoma. And this will, okay. this will facilitate uh, uh, the oxygen delivery yet to those mitochondria and produce more energy locally there and, uh, and destruction of right. oxygen will probably maximize. But that, that okay. this... Uh, just uh, guessing that it may be because we don't okay. really know. I'm glad you mentioned capillaries because I, I kept thinking in back of my mind, we keep talking about delivery, oxygen delivery, and we're just talking about sort of the heart and the blood vessels and we're not really, and then we're talking about the mitochondria, but we're leaving out the capillaries. So naturally with the cardiac output, you know, it's all very well, you can be pumping all this blood from your heart, but it's actually got to get through the muscle. And then we know that obviously that the endurance trained people have more capillaries per muscle fiber. Yeah. And they've got more mitochondria and you're saying if they've got more mitochondria under the muscle membrane, which is the, the, um, sarcolemma, uh, it means that, that there's less distance for it to travel. Is that right? From the capillary that, to that, the. That, that, that will be one of the advantages. Actually, there is a knockout model. Uh, non knockout. There is a mice model of expressing myoglobin and knockout of myoglobin. So the, the knockout of myoglobin, the knockout of myoglobin adapts to the lack of myoglobin. The myoglobin is a protein that helps to transport oxygen from the interstitial space to the mitochondria. So, so those mice that they don't have myoglobin they are they're able to have a normal life, but they have adaptations that develop during fetal life. And those adaptations consist in increased capillarization 
and increase sarcoderma mitochondria. So, so we think that the elite athlete is, is using some of those strategies, increase capillarization, and probably mm -hmm. increase sarcoderma mitochondria. And we don't know what, if there is some kind of intracellular arrangement of myoglobin or not, we don't know this. Mm -hmm. And oh, we don't know exactly you. the structure of this muscle. So it would be quite important to be able to study the ultra structure of the very best humans, mm -hmm. the humans. Now, another thing I guess we've sort of skipped over a little bit, and, and an another way to know that you can increase your VO2 max by increasing oxygen delivery is to increase your hemoglobin, so increase your red blood cells. I guess we've sort of skipped over that a bit. So you've got the cardiac output, so how much blood the, the heart is pumping, but you also obviously is important how much oxygen is bound and carried in the blood. So do you want to just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what red blood cells, hemoglobin, et cetera, why they're important. And I yeah. guess you've, you've touched on males and females a couple of times. So how, why that may be important in that regard as well. Yeah. It's uh, a hemoglobin is a molecule that, uh, that binds oxygen and transport oxygen in blood. Actually 99% of the oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. If we didn't have hemoglobin, the oxygen dissolved in the water of the blood will be very small. It's about 0 0.3 milliliters per 100 milliliters of blood, or three milliliters of oxygen per liter of blood. That's almost nothing. So then, but if you have more hemoglobin, so then you are able to transport more, more oxygen. And actually, if you increase the amount of hemoglobin in a, in a human, you can increase the VO2 max, even without training. So, so if you increase the hemoglobin concentration by the equivalent to receive two bags of blood, that is almost uh, one liter of blood, so then, mm -hmm. then your hemoglobin uh, concentration will be increased by uh, from... Uh, uh, like 15 to 18 or, or 19 grams per 100 milliliters, and then your bo 2 mass will be improved by 10, 12 percent. So, so, so you really can improve your bo 2 mass by increasing your hemoglobin concentration, and this is applicable to untrained people and trained athletes. And actually, what we know about trained athletes is that they are more limited by oxygen delivery. So they may be even more sensitive to an increase in hemoglobin concentration. And this yes. is probably why uh, EPO was so popular yes. as a mechanism to enhance performance in the past. Absolutely. Well, in the past, <laughs> you're, yes, you're, yeah. a, you're I'm, a, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic about trusting this. chap. Sorry? I say that I am optimistic about this. I you are optimistic. That's what it was. As I said trusting. People. People is going down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to put it together, then, so we're talking about how much heart the the, the how much um, blood the heart is pumping, but also how much oxygen has come from the lungs and bound to the hemoglobin in the red blood cells, will then be very important in terms of oxygen, well, critical to oxygen delivery. And then, as you were saying, the mitochondria, the fact that you, if you increase your, um, how much oxygen you breathe in, so therefore how much oxygen is on the hemoglobin. Or if you increase the hemoglobin, you increase your VO2 max, again proves that it's oxygen delivery and that the mitochondria in the muscle can take up more oxygen if it's delivered to it. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. And that is a very important question to answer. That is, what happens if we combine both things? If we have hyperoxia and increase hemoglobin? Mm -hmm. so, so where's the limit? Will the mitochondria still going up? You see more mm -hmm. oxygen, but we don't have the answer for these questions in elite athletes. Has no one looked at that? No, not in elite athletes. Oh, there's a, there's a study idea. Yes, that's a good idea. Um, now, I, I mentioned the females, but I think we forgot about that bit. So do you want to just talk about how females have lower hemoglobin and, and how, how that maybe plays a role in their VO2 max? Yeah, females in the... It is uh, mammals in general, you know, it's not something special to humans. They have low hemoglobin concentration. So, so then uh, the difference in hemoglobin concentration 
is it it almost account for the difference in VO2 max between males and females. So if if we if we take the values for elite athletes, the the difference between uh, the highest VO2 max of an elite athlete male compared to a female per per kilogram of body mass is around 16%. That is a little bit less than the difference in hemoglobin concentration. The difference mm. in hemoglobin concentration usually is a little bit larger than 15%. So so then so then it means that it, it may happen that females they are able to compensate somehow for the lower level of hemoglobin that they have. And actually we have some indication that that this is happening because there are some studies showing that females are able to extract more oxygen than males. Okay. But this, this for the normal population is probably going like this. But for elite athletes, when you have a male elite athlete that is extracting 98, 97% across the leg, so the, the female cannot do better than this. I was wondering. I thought maybe the world record holder was a female, but no. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. One of the one of the very high ones was a female. Okay. So, but, yeah, but we have seen similar, similar very high values in males. So mm -hmm. the point is that when you are when you are extracting ninety seven or ninety eight percent, maybe females are able to have ninety eight, and the very good male athletes they have ninety seven. So the the mm -hmm. the room is three percent. And if the difference is 1% in favor of females, that will mean 30% more of this difference. But uh, okay. we are very close to the limit of detection. Detection. Of yes. system. I was wondering how you could detect that because it's because it is quite hard to measure oxygen. You now we've method, measured um, arterial venous oxygen differences in some of the studies I've done, and you've got to be pretty tight on your measurements to. Uh, yeah, pick when it up. you have. When they have this uh, very high extractions, so then even the small amount of oxygen that may be leave in the port will have an influence. So, so we know that when we are detecting ninety-seven percent extraction, that means that we are having a subject with a saturation of a vein that is three percent. So we know that uh, that it may be even higher destruction because there is always some contamination from the atmosphere. Even when they uncap the serine to put the yeah, serine to the measuring uh, uh, device. So then when they uncap the serine, there is air in the atmosphere. So that will get in. Exactly, yeah, it's true. Because you take the sample and then you cap it, but the last little bit is going to be exposed to the oxygen. Yes, and tap in the sample and the time that you get into the measuring device, it can true. rise a little bit the amount of oxygen. Yep. Now, I was just thinking, something you said earlier, is the fact that um, untrained people, they don't really desaturate. So we haven't used this term desaturate, but when you, when the hemoglobin has got, you know, full of oxygen, it's saturated with oxygen, and then you desaturate when you reduce, remove the oxygen. Because the untrained people at VO2 max, they're not really extracting, you know, you're talking about, you know, 75% of the oxygen has been removed. And, and you touched on how the endurance trained people, the very well trained, they extract so much that, if anything, they are more limited by oxygen delivery than the untrained people. And the other thing is that the hemoglobin levels, assuming you haven't been taking erythropoietin, tend to be lower in a well-trained person as well because of this increase in plasma volume. Did you want to just talk about that a little bit, the so-called pseudonemia, and how, again, it's even more beneficial for these um, endurance trained people to try and increase their hemoglobin. But again, we do not want them to be taking erythropoietin, but yeah. Yeah, at, um, the elite athletes, they have uh, plasma volume expansion. Not, not, I mean, they have blood volume expansion. They have a higher blood volume than untrained people. But then, then the training may also induce some plasma volume expansion. And this, this is uh, in part is due to the necessity to thermoregulate because you need to sweat. And to be able to sweat, 
you need to have water in the circulation and having a larger plasma volume facilitates sweating. And we know that uh, that this is likely one of the reasons because if you have people taking sauna and adapting to, to heat, they also expand the plasma volume. And it's also one of the- oh, Sauna, they, sauna, yes, sorry. Uh, if they take yeah. a sauna, uh, the heat stress they increase their plasma volume and yeah okay yeah, yeah. so then uh, and because endurance exercise means to have hypothermia because you have uh, the the blood temperature can go up to from 37 at rest it can go up to 38 38 and a half and you can be in this situation during one hour two hours etc or even higher if uh, there is heat stress mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. then the, the athletes, the endurance athletes, normally they develop adaptation to the situation and they will increase uh, plasma volume. So, so if you have a larger plasma volume, so then this may also help to produce a higher cardiac output because this can increase um, venous return, the amount of blood that is coming back to the heart. And if there is more blood arriving to the heart, there will be more feeling of the heart during the diastole. The and then when the heart contracts, it can pump a large amount of blood. But also if the wall of the heart gets a little bit more stretch, when it contracts, it's more efficient and it's producing more, more force against the blood at mm -hmm. the same energy expenditure. So, so then developing uh, some enlargement of the blood volume is advantageous. Is advantageous, yes, yes, and 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 as you said, so so you get an increase in blood volume because you've got more hemoglobin total mass with training, but you will get a get an even greater increase in plasma volume, so yeah, you end up so getting this dilution of the blood, yeah. so the hemoglobin actually drops. Uh -huh. Sorry, yeah, if you have a little bit of hemodilution, and actually, if you have too much hemodilution, so this will. Uh, reduce oxygen delivery. So to compensate for this, you will need to increase cardiac output even more. And and then uh, so then, but we don't know in the in the very well trained athlete, the elite athlete, if uh, if he may be in a situation where where he's hampered by the emodilution. We, we, yes. we don't in terms of oxygen delivery at maximal exercise. But the athletes that they do endurance exercise during the exercise, they are not at maximal cardiac output. They are at, mm -hmm. at a lower fraction of the maximal exactly. cardiac output, 85%, 80%. So, and in those conditions, there will be no problem for having hemodilution. So the hemodilution could be a detrimental factor for oxygen delivery, if it's too high, just at maximal exercise. Exactly, because not not submax. So we'll talk about submax later. But um, the interesting thing here, and it's a bit of a personal thing for me, because um, when I used to be a distance runner, I had really low hemoglobin. Uh, it was like um, my my hematocrit, so what my percent of red blood cells out of the total was thirty six percent, and my hemoglobin was twelve point six per 100 um, uh, grams per 100 mils, which is lower. And, and the, th the silly thing is the doctor didn't know about this pseudo anemia that you can get when you endurance train, especially in summer, as you said, because you had that heat stress. So they sent me off to a hematologist and I got iron shots and everything. When in reality, years later, I realized while I was doing my PhD with Mark Hargraves, that if you actually measure the total hemoglobin, so rather than how much hemoglobin is, 100 mils of blood. But if you look at the total hemoglobin, even these athletes that have reduced, reduced hemoglobin per 100 mils, they probably have a very high total hemoglobin. And oh, yeah. so anyway, this, that's why it's called pseudo anemia. Yeah. But what yeah. I, the point I was going to get at is that they, like me back then, would have benefited a lot by increasing my hemoglobin. <laughs> if, you know, I'm not suggesting people take erythropoietin or blood yeah. dope, but Hmm. Yeah, do you know your view to Max of that time? I don't want to show off, but I was 78. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it will be, so, you know, it can be estimated. Yeah, there are questions that we can use. No, it was measured. It was 70, it was 78 a couple of times. Uh, so, 
then, then you will be very sensitive to an increase in hemoglobin concentration. Exactly. So I, 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 I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. But years later, when I realized um, that the total hemoglobin mass was anyway later on, when I realized that athletes can push their hematocrit up to like forty eight percent or something like that. I mean, hang on, I was 36%. So to increase it to 48%, you would actually be delivering a third more oxygen, right? Because 36 plus 12, you'd be delivering a third more oxygen. So I think I would have been going slightly faster. Anyway, yeah. it's not about me. Um, yeah. But that's interesting, yeah? And, and it's something, and again, it's a temptation for these people to take these. So, So agents. you will you will have a theoretical maximal VO2 max higher, but then during some maximal exercise, you will also have better endurance because of the large hemoglobin concentration. So you will increase your performance, not only your VO2 max. Okay, now this, this is, come on, you just make me feel bad now. But anyway, this is what I wanted to, you know, about how, how I would have been different. But I wouldn't have taken, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have blood doped anyway. Um, the point is here, I want to ask you, and this is perfect that you got to your submax, because one of my questions was, um, you know, how, how does, so, you know, people take these agents to increase their red blood cell mass and their, their hemoglobin mass, but that's great. You know, that's, that's having a high hemoglobin mass is going to improve your VO to max. But what I don't get is how does it improve their submax? So, you know, these people that do, blood dope and take EPO and things like that. They don't, it doesn't really matter what their VO to max is. When you're doing the Tour de France or something, you're not going at VO to max. You might be going at 70%, 75%, 80%, who knows? Why does that improve? Why does having a higher hemoglobin mass and a higher maximum oxygen delivery, why does that improve your sub-maximum exercise? Oh, that's, um, if you if you increase the hemoglobin mass, you need some maximal exercise, so the lactate production is reduced and the metabolism is, is like you are shifting the, the, the lactate threshold to the right as you were more trained. So and what is going to happen is that you will be relying more in fat oxidation than carbohydrate at the same speed. So, so it's having a, a very big effect on, on metabolism during exercise. And then this reflects also in endurance. Endurance capacity is much increased by um, okay. hemoglobin, increasing hemoglobin. All right. Now, I'm not getting this. Okay. So um, what, what I always think and we talk about is that VO2 max uh, is, your, is your maximum, but your performance, your submax is more determined by your periphery. So how much lactate you're producing, for example. And I'm just I'm I'm just missing that. So so because your submax and the oxygen delivery is not the limiting factor, how does that affect your lactate threshold and your lactate production? Yeah. So imagine that you have a VO2 max of 60 milliliters per kilo, and you increase your hemoglobin, and then you increase your VO2 max to 80 milliliters per kilo, and mm -hmm. you are doing exercise running at uh, 16 kilometers per hour. Lower percentage of your max, okay, okay. You need, and you need uh, 40 milliliters per kilo to run at 16 kilometers uh -huh. per hour. So, yeah, okay. so you have increased your VO2 max, so the relative intensity is reduced. Less percentage of your max. And the hormonal response and the, and the perception of, uh, of exercise, assertion, et cetera, is reduced. So, so actually, the athletes that they dope with EPO, they 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 feel it very much. That's why it was so successful because oh. they were feeling it very very much. Okay, because so of the it, lower percentage of their max. Okay, so to, to make sure people are clear, sorry, I kind of cut you off. So if you're going at the same speed, and you've got a VO two max of eighty instead of sixty or seventy or whatever it is, you're at a lower percentage of your max, and you do better. Now I'm still going to think about this later. I still work in the lactate production because it's taking out the periphery. But anyway, we'll just hold that thought. Um, okay, now we're talking about what limits VO to max here. Yeah? Now, what about what determines your VO to max? So 
So what I mean is things like genetics, yeah? Things like um, whether you're going to have a naturally high VO to max, even if you don't train, and then your ad 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 adaptability. So I had Claude Bouchard on, who's the big legend on this stuff, um, last year, and he was talking about how the genes that determine your VO to max without training are actually not the same as the genes that determine your ability to adapt to training. So that was interesting. So just talking about, yeah, what determines, you know, why is, is some people like VO to max is kind of okay. They've got to naturally fit, you know, even if they don't train and then other people are, you know, adapt much more, et cetera. What, what's, what, what's going on there? So we have, we have uh, two, two factors to consider. One is um, the genetic determinants of structures that you need for a high bio demand, for example. It's the, you need to have a higher percentage of type 1 fibers because type 1 fibers, they have more mitochondria, more capillaries. And this yeah. the genetic. It's, uh, it's determined genetically. Training is doing not much in their muscle fiber type. So then, mm -hmm. so then another structural factor is the size of your heart. And the size of your heart is to a large extent inherited. So there is room for adaptation, but the room for adaptation is you can increase the weight of your heart by training and the size of your heart by something like 30%. So that means that a large component of the size of your heart is genetic. So then when you put all the genetic factors together, so this will give you the potential. So if you achieve the minimum potential that is needed to become a champion, a winner of the Tour of France, then you need to add on top of this very good training. Mm -hmm. And then and then there is the other factor to consider that is your response to training, your 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 adaptability. Mm. And and this this varies a lot in the population, but for elite athletes, it's very high. So they they have a high potential, and then they respond very well to training. We we know that they are able to increase the O2 max by 20, 30 percent, and we know that when they stop training, they lose this 20, 30 percent that they have increased with uh, training. Yep, perfect. So the genetic factor probably explains 70% of the, of the effect minimum, minimum. 70%, 70? 70 okay. or, or 80% of, uh, of, the, of the capacity to reach this high bio max. So the room for, for training is small. Maybe it's training 20% of the, yes. the response. But let's make sure people are clear that, that what you're saying, therefore, is you have to have sort of that initially good genes. So you've got a, a big heart and a good ability to adapt and lots of slow twitch fibers and things like that. But then you have to train, right? And then your ad ad adaptability has to be also very high. Yeah. And then you end up where you're at, right? And you're not saying that, oh, they would have been 70% as good as if they hadn't trained. You're just saying that, that you had to have the genetics to start with and to adapt to then end up and it ends up 70% of the reason they're so good is genetic. Yeah. But it's not like yeah. they could just sit around and do nothing and be 70% as good, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So you need, you need to have proper genetics. That's determinant. Without the genetics, there is no possibility. Yes. But then, but then you have room for training. Hmm. Yes. So, um, yeah, it was interesting. I, I touched on this before, but yeah, Claude Bouchard, I, th I thought it was really interesting that he said that the genes that determine how good you are initially are not the same genes that determine how much you adapt. So what you actually need is to have the good genes initially and the good genes for adapting, and then you end up really good. Yeah, because actually the studies of Claude Bouchard, um, they, when, when I think he's the one having also a twin study, huh? Was uh, yes. that a, a twin study? And this study was showing something like uh, that there is a concordance in, it, in, in the response to training. And this concordance was about uh, um, uh, was 50% uh, of the response could be explained, of the adaptability to training could be explained 
by by the genes because the correlation was something like uh, like uh, 0.6 between the adaptation the training and then then you have to put into this into this correlation the fact that bo 2 max is not increasing a lot it's increasing 15 percent 20 percent 10 percent in those studies in those subjects and then you have the variability in the assessment of bo 2 max and if you were removing all the variability factors, probably the, the genetic component of the adaptability has been underestimated in those studies due to the problem with the assessment of bo 2 max that is having some variability. So you may have a difference in bo 2 max of three, five percent. And if the response to training is 10 percent, so even if you have a sample of subject that is large, this is going to put noise into your model. And then you will mm. conclude that the, that the genetic factor is actually a little bit lower than that it really is. Okay, I get you. So, so, so I, think, I think that the studies of Claude Bouchard also agree that, uh, that you need uh, a high adaptability potential to reach uh, yes. the top level. Let me ask you something else about Claude Bouchard's studies. So he has these classic um, uh, data where he shows you've got like high responders and low responders and things like that. And even that some people don't respond to training. Now, I've, I have I had John Hawley on at one stage and, and we were talking about this. I don't feel like I've ever done a training study, and I don't think he has either, where no the person has not responded at all to training. Have you Have you seen that? I just find it almost unphysiological to, to say that someone could train and not yes. adapt. So so you will see very few adaptation, no doubt, no doubt about this. So, but in terms of, of bo 2 max, it may happen that you have subjects that they just improve very little, 5% or 6%, because the mm. mean, the mean is going to be 15%. 20% if you are if you are having untrained people. Mm -hmm. But 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 if you train them hard enough, why would they not adapt? So even 5%, but he had some that were like just 0%. Surely just for, just evolutionary wise or whatever, you would get an increase in your left ventricle size so you could pump pump more blood. Surely you'd have to, but you're saying it may be small, like 5%. It's hard to pick it up. Yeah, is actually the there are the study of uh, of uh, Cal uh, Calderon and uh, Javier Calderon and uh, Dustin Lumbi, where they where they look at this problem of non-responders, and what they did they published this in Journal of Physiology, quite interesting study. So so they trained the subjects and then they took the ones that were non-responding and they add more training to them, different mm -hmm. training program, more training, different. and then, mm -hmm. and then they adapted, they increased exactly. the demand. But they don't increase that much. So, so it's a reality that some people you train them and they don't, don't adapt that much. The automatic not increasing that much. And okay. your performance is not improving that much. Mm -hmm. That's why I think I remember the paper now that yeah, if they tried them like doing cycling and they didn't improve, but then if you tried running or you know, you try a different stimulus, you get something out of them, but not much. Is that fair to say? And I guess it would go back to Claude Bouchard's genetic uh, studies showing that they have low ad adapt adaptability. I guess you don't want to have a low initial and a low adaptability. It'd be a bit sad. Okay. One th one thing that's interesting is um, Ilva Halston was on last week and she was talking about blood flow during exercise and um, so cardiovascular responses to exercise. And one thing we talked about um, was, was arms versus legs. And well, sorry, not specifically that, but the, the battle that the body has to maintain its blood pressure um, while it's exercising, but also delivering blood. So do you want to just talk about that a bit? So we talked about if you opened all your blood vessels, you know, your blood pressure could drop. So just that that sort of concept of, of uh, maintaining your blood pressure, but also delivering, ha having dilation and delivering a lot of blood and, and, and the difference between arm exercise and leg exercise and all that sort of stuff. So, so the point here is that um, because the amount of blood that can go to each muscle, the potential is very big. 
So if all Muslims were receiving the highest amount that they can receive, so then what would happen is that the heart is not able to pump this very high cardiac output. And actually, and actually, if the, if if the peripheral tissues they are not uh, vasoconstricting a little bit to to restrain vasodilation, what what is happening is that that the blood pressure drops. So, so you need to have a little bit of vasoconstriction during exercise. And, and this, this is probably very important when you are doing whole body exercise. And, and then when you are doing a small mass exercise, you need a very high pressure because then the heart, what it's doing is, is, is pumping very hard because it's trying to push as much blood as possible uh, throughout the muscle. So then, so then when you are doing a small mass exercise, you use the pressure to increase the oxygen delivery. So you have more pressure, you have more flow. But uh, when you're doing full body exercise and you have achieved the maximal working capacity of the heart, you cannot increase further the pressure because the heart cannot overcome this level of pressure. And then if, if, if the pressure is dropping because you don't have restraint in some area, so then blood perfusion to the brain will be reduced and then you will feel very fatigued and you will have to stop mm -hmm, the exercise. Mm -hmm. so, so this is better illustrate for what is happening in paraplegics. When, when paraplegics, they do exercise with the legs, this has a trick, of course, because paraplegics, they cannot move the legs, but they can be electrically stimulated to make them to move the legs and to bike. So, so when they have done this experiment with paraplegics, those paraplegics that they have a spine, a spinal core injury that is a thoracic or a thoracic low level, that they have a preserved sympathetic system. The sympathetic system is a part of the nervous uh, system, peripheral nervous system that is producing a vasoconstriction and is helping to distribute the blood flow. So the paraplegics that they have a high spinal cord injury, they are not able to maintain arterial blood pressure during exercise when they do electrical induced exercise. And the paraplegics that they have a lower spinal cord, that they have a functional sympathetic system, they have also hypotension, but much less hypotension. And in this case, okay. The factor that is different is afferent information. So the paraplegic is not having afferent information. Afferent information is information that is conducted by the nerve from the periphery to the spinal cord to the brain. And this information is used to regulate blood pressure during exercise. So, so then it's the combination of, of central command sympathetic activation and uh, peripheral uh, afferent information that uh, that will govern the response, the pressure response to our society. Okay. How about I just kind of summarize that and you tell me if I'm right here. Okay. So when you're exercising, if if you opened up all the blood vessels and all your muscles, yeah, then then there would be too many open pipes. So if like, if you're doing, I said this with the elbow as well, if you're doing like a sprinkler system, yeah, and you're trying to like have the water and your sprinkler going to every little bed, there wouldn't be enough pressure, right? So you've got to like close some areas to maintain the pressure. And it's the same you're saying with the heart. So even though you need blood flow to your contracting muscles, if you had lots of blood flow going everywhere, then the pressure would drop too much. So you have to have this vasoconstriction, as you say, which is the contracting the muscle the blood vessels to make them not as open. Yeah. So, and then you said the paraplegics show that because depending on where they've got the deficit, if if they're not getting that that constriction happening, their blood pressure drops. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. The blood pressure drops if you don't have a sympathetic activation. So the sympathetic system is critical for this. And you also need the peripheral information. The ergoreceptors, the, the, the 
the nerve, the peripheral nerve, the sensory endings that are telling the brain how hard is the exercise. Is there lactate in the muscle? Is some metabolite uh, accumulating in the muscle? So how is the pressure that is generated by the contraction of the muscle? All this information is computed by the brain and is used to, to decide on the level of sympathetic activation and the level of vasoconstriction that you are going to have during the exercise. Right. All right. Yeah, I kind of glossed over that because I thought it might have got a bit confusing. Okay. Now, I know you've done a whole bunch of studies. So the last time um, when I saw you here in Copenhagen, I was here in 2013, and it ended up in Bank Saltine's last study, I think, um, yeah. before he died in 2014. Um, you were looking at determinants of VO2 max in Masters athletes, and you had incredible athletes. Do you want to just tell us tell us about those sort of studies and, and what, what what you're finding? You know, how are these people able to achieve? Because I mean, one of the guys there, I think he just won the world championships or something for his age, had a yeah. VO2 max of still 70 or something, at, you know, 70 years old or something crazy. Why don't you just tell us what's happening in these Masters athletes? So so those we were comparing those master athletes with elderly of the same age. Actually, they were 65 years old, eh? the, mean, the mean value, and then to young sedentary subjects. And then those master athletes, they were having a VO2 max that was similar to the sedentary subjects that were 20 something years old. And the cardiovascular response to exercise was very similar to the one we were seeing in the young subjects. But the guy, there was one guy, they, they had they had a higher oxygen extraction, oxy, systemic oxygen extraction. The, the oxygen extraction across the leg, I think, was around 92% oxygen extraction. So they had a very high oxygen extraction. And the, the cardiac output was was reduced compared to the one that you will see in a young elite athlete. But but it was it was a little it was similar to the cardiac output of the of the young subjects, or maybe a little bit higher, but the stroke volume was much higher. So 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 actually what they have is a, a reduced maximum heart rate, that's something you see with age. And the stroke volume probably compared to the one that they could have achieved when they were younger was also reduced. But but despite this, the stroke volume they had was similar or larger than the one of a young um, sedentary male. All of them were male. So, so in, in the end, what this indicates is that due to genetic factors or the combination of genetic factors and long life uh, exercise, so, so they had a cardiovascular system that was working very similar to the one of a young subject. Of a, a young, subject. untrained, young, a young, untrained subject. Young, untrained. Actually, in some aspects, better than the young, untrained. Okay. And you these mean, are 65 year olds? Yeah. Sorry? Uh, 65 year olds, is that what you said? 65 year olds was the mean. But we had one guy that was 71 year old that he was a former uh, Olympic uh, medalist in Montreal. So, so he reported that when he was young, he was having a VO2 max about 80 milliliters per kilo. When we saw him, it was something like 55, 57 milliliters per kilo, the mm -hmm. VO2 max. And the cardiac output was 27 liters per minute. So you can compare 27 liters per minute with the cardiac output of a sedentary untrained, uh, an, an, an untrained young man that would be 20 liters per minute. So he's still having a very big right. cardiac output for 71 years old. And that guy, he was trying to compete with, uh, with uh, young untrained Soviets. He would beat almost everyone. Yes. Okay, so that's that's impressive. But I guess you know that person was a former, you know, Montreal Olympics. That was nineteen seventy six. It's a long time ago. 
Yeah. What about if you, I guess we're starting to think about lifelong sort of athletes versus what about if someone starts training at like at 50 and it trains like really, really hard? Do you think they could end up with, you know, at 70 or 65 with a uh, VO2 max? Well, maybe not a VO2 max, but a cardiac output that's comparable to a young, untrained person or not? No, I, I mean, the adaptability to train in elderly is, is reduced. So, so you can see in, there are reports with um, with uh, six month training where you can have increases of close to twenty percent in the automax. So, so that so that means that they probably are able to increase cardiac output by ten percent, fifteen percent. So, and this I'm talking about elderly. So then, so then that means that what you can expect if you you get a person that is already sixty years old, sixty five years old, and he starts to train, is that it will take a little bit longer to get the increase in the automax, but you can still increase the automax. Probably the response will be a little bit lower, and the increase in cardiac output will be a little bit lower, and that's probably why they don't improve that much. Um, the auto max, but still possible to improve the auto max. Even there is a report that is uh, from Veronique Villat that uh, that she studied a centenarian cyclist, and this mm. published in Applied Physiology, and this is an amazing study because that guy was uh, hundred years old, and he improved his VO2 max by ten percent. He he restarted to train, and he mm. beat. World record for centenarians in the hour in the hour wow. race. So you can improve your to max at any age, but the response will be to training will be a little bit lower. Yes, and, and it'll be coming from a low level as well. So it'll be a low, very low level to a ten percent higher of a very low level. There are some differences regarding female, elderly female. Because it seems that they have more problems to to develop cardiac adaptations to training, they are relying more in peripheral adaptations. But uh, but this is an area where we need uh, more studies using uh, gold standard methods that mean uh, invasive methods to have uh, very good uh, low variability information on the critical variables. Okay, now with talking about the cardiac output. And you said the heart rate is lower. So, you know, most people know, or a lot of people know that, you know, the maximum heart rate decreases by about one beat per year. So, you know, you tend to say 220 minus your age. Um, but is that the case even with training? Like, is that is that genetically set? And if you train, you can't affect that? Because <laughs> this is very selfish. But I, I've found that my maximum heart rate has not reduced as much as I thought it should. And also, I, I keep hearing of, of people, trained people, saying their maximum heart rate hasn't dropped as much as they thought it should. Is that just anecdotal or is that a thing? Yeah, yeah that's, that's uh, something um, that has been demonstrated, that uh, that uh, trained elderly, they have a potential to reach a higher maximum heart rate than uh, untrained counterparts of the same age. Oh, so, really? So that, okay. So that means that uh, with training, you can you can blunt, you can reduce the the drop of maximum no, no, right. with aging. But uh, no. what is uh, what is a thing that uh, we we don't know yet is that uh, if it will be possible to increase uh, cardiac output and VO2 max by increasing maximum weight in elderly. Okay. That's interesting. So I somehow thought it was just genetically said. It was just, you know, people even say things like, oh, you've got a set number of heartbeats in your life, which I know is kind of ridiculous. But um, I just, I didn't realize that. I, I just thought that was my thing and a couple of people I spoke to. But it has been shown that you can you can slow down the loss of your maximum heart rate, the reduction so, with so endurance lose, training. Yeah, yeah, they lose a little bit less. But then, then if I have to, to look at uh, anecdotal information, for example, there's a little athlete that, uh, that uh, was a Montreal champion. 
Montreal uh -huh. medalist, Montreal game, Olympic Games. That last yeah. Olympic game took took part in the 80, 86, I think. So so then that that guy he had a maximum heart weight that was uh, 140, something like this. Mm -hmm. That that actually actually is, is low, but but then the question is that why is so low? Because he was having a huge heart, so he could he could do it like this. And actually, you have a very big heart, and your heart rate is lower. You are more mm -hmm. efficient. So yep. so it's a very good adaptation. But on the other side, the loss of chronotropic response with aging is slowed down by mm -hmm. regular exercise and long life. That's very interesting. That, that's well established. Yeah, so it is interesting, and we touched on it earlier, that um, so a well-trained endurance person will have a lower resting heart rate, and they'll tend to have a lower maximum heart rate as well. But yeah. because their heart is bigger, their left ventricle is bigger, they're pumping a lot more blood. But what, you, what you'd what you actually like to have is someone who's got like a low resting heart rate and a high maximum heart rate, then they would be able to pump a lot of blood, yeah? Yeah, but but there is... There is uh... A fantastic study that was done by uh, Stefan Mortensen and uh, Neil Serker, where they put a pacemaker in cyclist, mm -hmm. and then they then they pace the heart to to beat like a uh, fifteen or twenty bit more uh -huh. at each vote, and then they check on the effect on cardiac output and leg blood flow all the way up to maximal values, and what mm -hmm. they saw was zero effect zero effect that's right on i think i remember that on maximal cardiac output but but the heart rate was much higher so and this study also indicates that the heart can be doing even more work than it's doing when you finish the exercise because the double product in that study that is a variable that you compute to estimate the oxygen demand of the heart was much higher when they placed the heart. So, so this was a very, very interesting study. Actually, it will be extremely interesting to do a similar study with uh, middle age or, or elderly mm -hmm. and check if they benefit or not from a higher True. rate. Put it back up to, to like 10 years earlier sort of, yeah. you know, not going crazy, but just putting it up like, you know, 10 beats or something closer to, to like when they were 10 years younger, for example. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Now that we've talked about the heart rate going down, but VO2 max, there's apparently it's a bit of a controversy about whether does VO2 max decrease, it decreases with age, right? But does exercise training reduce that reduction? Or is it just that the trained people start off higher? And it drops, and the untrained are lower, and it drops. But is that rate any different? Yeah, I. To, that, this is a very, very important question. So, so if we if we take a study um, that was published in a physiology where they study uh, young subjects and then they study octogenarians and then they study elite athletes that were octogenarians. And it was a study, I think one of the co-authors was uh, Trapp. So, oh, like Scott Trappy. Yeah, 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 from Ball State. Mm -hmm. So so then in that study, so you can see that the mean VO2 max for untrained males was around 45 milliliters per kilo. And mm -hmm. then the octogenarians that were healthy, and able to do a VO2 max test, they had around 22, 20 milliliters per kilo. Mm -hmm. but then they had elite athletes, and then they had a, a very, very good elite athlete that was 91 years old, mm -hmm. and that one was a gold medalist in Olympics and so on. And then he had a VO2 max of 36 milliliters per kilo, being 91 years old. So and if you go to to other people from the same cohort, so what you see more or less is that the 
the untrained subjects from 20 years of age to 80 something, they are losing 50% of the Biotomax. And if you look at the data list, they are losing a little bit more than 50% because you will expect them to be in the area of 80 milliliters per kilo. And when they are octogenarians, they are a little bit less than 40. 40. So, mm -hmm. so probably they lose proportionally a little bit less. But what matters here is that the value that they have is in the range of the 90% interval con uh, confidence interval for young subjects. That means that they are able to compete with untrained young subjects and they mm. will beat some of them. Yes. I've been of the generations. So, yes, so, so these lifelong exercise people have higher VO2 maxes when they're at their best, but then if anything, they drop the same or maybe even slightly more with age, but they're proportion, still... Proportion. Yeah, value. same proportion, but they end up kind of at the same level as the untrained people later, you know, young un untrained people. So they're much, much better off, off obviously. Yeah, they are they are able to compete with uh, with untrained young Soviets, but it's remarkable. It is remarkable. It's fantastic. And what about the mitochondria, I guess? Um, so, you know, often we're thinking about the reductions that you see with age. A lot of it is just inactivity, yeah? Um, I know you haven't looked at the mitochondria so much, but do you know that the reductions in mitochondrial um, function and and uh, content that you get, do you feel like with age, it's it's really just the inactivity or do you think you get it as well, just age per se? Actually, what is, what is happening with mitochondria is that uh, with, with aging, you can increase mitochondrial density actually compared to a younger subject. <clears throat> but, extract more. But, but the mitochondria are less efficient. There is a very nice study by Steen Larsen and John Hurley and Fleming Della from Copenhagen, where they look at um, mitochondrial um, uh, Bmax and the mitochondrial Bmax per amount of mitochondria was reduced in elderly. So that means that the mitochondria are less efficient with elderly, and they are also producing more walls. They have more uncoupled, uncoupling. So, so the the mitochondria they are getting worse with aging, and this effect probably can be partly overcome uh, with training. Training, and this is happening in the heart. It's happening also in the peripheral muscles. So you're saying with aging, the, there's, there's a reduction in mitochondrial function, which is even more than the reduction in mitochondrial content. But if you exercise train, you can actually turn that around and your function will actually be more than the content. Is that what you're saying? You, you, will, no, you will not be able to turn this around because actually the train athletes, they still have, they still have um, impairments in mitochondrial function in elderly. So, but but this will be the effect will be smaller. So 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 you attenuate the loss in mitochondrial function with a regular exercise. But despite this, your mitochondria, because because of the of issues related with aging, they will perform less efficiently. So then you can compensate by increasing mitochondrial density with training. And then when you compare master uh, trained athletes with uh, younger athletes with the same PO2 max per kilo, what you can see is that the master athletes, they have a higher mitochondrial density. Content. So uh, yeah, density. Mm -hmm. they, need to, they need to have more mitochondria to achieve the same level. Exactly. So because, because their mitochondrial function is less, they need to have more content to end up with the same um, function, basically. Yep. Okay, I'll get you. Now, I did my master's with, with, masters with David Costal at Ball State. You mentioned Scott Trappy. Oh, he was, yeah. took, it, took over from yeah, David Costal. 
um, at Ball State. But he used to say, this is way back in, I was there 1989 to 1991. He used to say in terms of VO to max that he thought if you had 70 mils per kilogram per minute, that yes. that was enough that you can then pretty much do whatever you needed to do in terms of being, you know, a good marathon runner or whatever. And he'd always use these examples of, of like Frank Shorter had a VO to max of 72 and Steve Prefontaine had a VO to max of 84, but they were both similar because Frank Shorter's had a better lactate threshold and was more efficient and whatever. I'm just wondering, what do you think it, think about this? So in terms of what determines performance, it's not just VO to max and, you, and what sort of, VO to max, do you think, you know, you talk about 84 and 87 and all that. Do you think you need those numbers or it's, and I guess, yeah. sorry, just I had Andy Jones on and he was saying how you tend to find that people that have a really high VO to max don't tend to have a very good economy and they often don't, they don't always go hand in hand. Do you have any thoughts about any of that? Yeah, it's, um, this is a fascinating question. Because you can see some cases of some athletes that they don't have a huge view to max and they are gold medalists in the Olympics in disciplines that are endurance. So, so, but the, today, today, the reality today, the reality today is that, um, that to, to be a winner in marathon, you need uh, more than 80 milliliters per kilo in this moment. And, uh, and actually, and actually, this was not in the past, but it's, today is like this. And to be a so much faster now. Yeah. But this is for probably for marathon in this moment because they are, I think that they are able to run close to two hours. So, yeah. and even if you have a very good uh, running economy, and if you are able to use a very high fraction of your VO2 max during the competition, if you don't have a VO2 max that is very high, you are not able to run at this speed. So, so today you need to have a very high view to max. But then there is another question. There are some disciplines where a very high view to max is compulsory. So, so you need it. If you don't have it, you cannot uh, be winner. But there are others where you do, where view to max is not that critical. For example, mm. Ironman, ultra endurance. For those disciplines, you exactly. can be a winner maybe with uh, 60 milliliters per kilo, 65 milliliters per kilo, because mm -hmm. there are many more factors that will uh, that will determine uh, the outcome of, of the race. And actually the fraction of the VO2 max that you need to use is not as high. Mm -hmm. But in disciplines mm -hmm. where the mean speed is very high, for example, 1500 meters. Exactly. So, so the so the Running. the oxygen demand is very high, so you need to have a very high oxygen delivery, and to achieve and you can only have a very high oxygen delivery. You have a very high cardiac output, and you need yeah. a very high VO two max. Yes, exactly. Because David Costa used to always say five minutes was about if you went as hard as you could, you know, pacing yourself for five minutes, four or five minutes, you'd be at pretty much VO two max. So that makes sense, therefore, that you're saying like a 1500 meter running race takes four or five minutes. You're pretty much at your VO2 max. So you have obviously have to have a high VO2 max to do well. But the longer you go, the less percentage of your VO2 max you're at. And, yeah. you know, so as you said, at Ironman, or Ultra, whatever, you're not at a high percent of your VO2 max. So in, in, in a way, it gets a bit confusing, but your VO2 max doesn't be, have to be that high because you're not actually getting that close to it. So just say you're doing a an Ironman, you might be at, I don't know, 65% of your VO to max. It it doesn't, well, just say you need three liters, for example, of oxygen to do that workload. It doesn't really matter if your max is five liters, five and a half, four and a half. You only need three liters. Is that, yeah. is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah, exactly. because 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 you because the oxygen demand, the, the, the amount of energy that you need is a little bit lower per unit of time. So you can do it. With a lower VO2 max, at the expense of using a higher fraction of your VO2 max, but uh, when you compare um, Costilera runners with today runners for the mm -hmm. 15 period, the, you have to take into account that the mean speed is much higher today. So the energy, the energy you need is much higher today, 
And the running economy, it may have changed a little bit because of the courses and the surfaces and the tools, and but it doesn't account for the total amount extra that you exactly. need. And that's why today you need a higher VO2 max. To Absolutely. In so, those, uh, you know, we're talking so about Frank, Sh Frank Shorter won the 1972 Marathon Olympics, but, you know, he probably ran 212, 214, something like that. I don't know exactly. So you're saying, but but you know that you might have got away with having a VO two max of seventy two mils back then if you're running at that speed, but now you've got to run two hundred two, two hundred three, two hundred four to win the Olympics. You can't do that with a VO two max of seventy two, no matter how efficient you are. Is that what you're saying? That's that's what I think. <laughs> it makes I sense mean, to me. I mean, it were, could be it. It will depend on the characteristics of the race, but if you have seventy two. You can run the race probably, but it but it will be very unlikely that you are the winner because there will be another guy that that will have eighty or eighty two and will and will have the same almost the same genetics, same race, coming from the same country, and he will beat you. Did you see the other day that a uh, female? It just slipped my name the name now ethiopian woman ran 211 54 for the marathon broke the world record by two minutes so now the females are running the women are running 211 52 yeah yeah that's amazing that's uh... and i remember they, they were saying because a bibi bakila who's an ethiopian who won the olympics he ran 212 and now we've got a female ethiopian running 212 um it's just incredible i, I, I will expect you will have Probably more than seventy milliliters per kilo VO two max. That's Which is amazing. All right, now that's a good little introduction here. So, uh, Jem Arnold wrote uh, difference if on Twitter. He wrote uh, differences in metabolic strategies between females and males at sub max and max intensity. Are there differences in strategies? Recent publications on that topic have been fascinating and complex. Do you know about that? Different metabolic strategies to you know, during submax. I, I suppose that uh, he means uh, differences in uh, two straight oxidation during exercise. And uh, in this case, uh, what we know is that females they rely more in fat oxidation during some maximal exercise than males. But uh, when you are approaching uh, PO2 max, when you are above. Uh, uh, lactate threshold, but close to the automax. So you are you have to rely on carbohydrate oxidation, and this applies to males and females. So there is no this factor will not be a difference for uh, in, intensities that are close to the automax or supramaximal intensities. But during an Ironman, for example, females may be using more relying more in a fat oxidation that makes. On the other hand, we have a spring kind of exercise or supramaximal exercise, 120% of the automatic, 140% of the mm -hmm. automatic. This exercise intensity, so part of the energy is coming from glycolytic uh, production of lactate, and another part is coming from phosphocreatine hydrolysis. And then glycolytic capacity and uh, phosphocreatine hydrolysis capacity is higher for type two fibers that are fast fibers. And females, mm -hmm. they normally have double proportion of fast fibers. So so then fem and females, they have lower glycolytic capacity. So then, so then during supramaximal exercise, they are expected to perform below males because they have a lower anaerobic capacity that is explained in part by differences in fiber type. Fiber and also because glycolytic capacity is lower in females. So they have a lower amount of phosphofructokinase that is the limiting enzyme of the glycolysis and other enzymes that determine the, the rate of the glycolysis. So I wonder why that is. Who knows, evolutionary-wise, that females have lower hemoglobins, so lower VO2 maxes. They also have lower 
which is more on the aerobic side, but then also with the anaerobic side, they have less ability to produce lactate, less ability to be to, to do anaerobic metabolism because they have less fast fibers. So, uh, so somehow maybe, they got the raw deal. I, I don't know. You can always try to figure out explanation for this. You can say females, they need to be pregnant. When they are pregnant, they are overload. They need to be able to endure when they are overload. Humans, mm. they, were, they were not staying permanently in, in any place. They were moving and wandering around looking for food. So, so yeah. they had to be able to follow the rest, and uh, that may be an explanation. Then you may and the also men were more hunters, and the women were more more gatherers, etc. Uh, you can also think about uh, reproduction too. So, so male had to be able to to get the female, so he has to run faster to get the female for something. <laughs> That's true. In terms of, okay. in terms of if... evolution and species, you know, so 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 they he needs to have more spring capacity was to secure reproduction for sample. Maybe to run away from the other, from the jealous yeah. partner yeah. or something. Okay, now Mark had a question. You just mentioned creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine. He said, why does creatine supplementation limit absolute VO to max? I don't know if you know this, but but it is a strange one. If you creatine supplement, you tend to get a reduction in your VO to max. I haven't heard about this. And actually, it it doesn't make sense to me that by supplementing uh, creatine, you will reduce the VO2 max. Actually, in theory, if you increase the amount of phosphocreatine, this could facilitate uh, um, uh, ATP shuttling between the mitochondria yeah. and the protoplasm. Actually, it can be facilitating things. But on the other side, if you supplement with creatine, you may increase uh, water retention in the muscles. So mm -hmm. you can increase your body weight by one kilo, one kilo and a half. And this could affect negatively endurance because the economy of movement will be a little bit reduced. So if he's talking about potential detrimental effect in endurance, so could be by this mechanism of increasing uh, body uh, what accumulation well, he actually, in the market? He actually said, be, but, uh, he actually said absolute VO2 max. And there was a recent um, you know, meta-analysis and they showed it did. So I, I have to have a look at that one. It's a weird one. So Sick Lispo, I think it is, on Twitter said, how to determine how close or far someone is to reaching their own maximum potential in terms of VO2 max? How to know if someone has yet margin to improve? So that's an interesting one. I guess without doing a VO2 max test, I guess they're asking. So so the the training background, the history, will be a factor. So if someone has been training well, hard, during minimum six months, probably it has already reached 90% or, or maybe more of its potential. So, so if you have been training for several years and you have been training well, probably you are very close to to your potential. But then there are some tests that you can you can do to see if your you could improve more your VO2 max or not. One is to measure your hemoglobin concentration. If your hemoglobin concentration is, is low, you have 12 and a half, 13 and a half. So then you could improve your VO2 max by improving your hemoglobin concentration. And there are legal methods that can be used to try to increase your hemoglobin concentration, like uh, altitude training for some. Altitude something. training. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so that, that would be one possibility. The other one is that you could also try to do a hyperoxia test and see if your VO2 max increase. Your VO2 max increase means you have the potential to increase VO2 max if you increase oxygen delivery and you improve your PO2, your arterial PO2 uh, during exercise, that's the arterial pressure, in the, the oxygen pressure in the artery. And this depends on the pulmonary function. So, so maybe you will have uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, bronchoconstriction or problem that limits your ventilation that could be improved and improve your PO2. And another factor is that if you are able to measure your, the saturation in your femoral vein 
And this saturation in the femoral vein tends to be not very low. So, so you can think maybe I'm able to reach the level of elite athletes by training. So, so there are ways to try to figure out this. Actually, we we have been developing in Las Palmas with a group of engineers a device that that the aim is to calculate the oxygen saturation in the femoral vein, non-invasive mm -hmm. vein. So when this device is ready, one way to go will be to measure or estimate the saturation in the femoral vein. Steve, you're extracting a lot of oxygen or not? Yeah, because because if you if you're extracting a lot of oxygen, so so maybe you can do a lot of uh, training, room to move training and try to induce mitochondrial biogenesis and capillarization. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, can I suggest you, a, a, a can I suggest an e maybe an easier way of working out if you're near your potential? It's fair enough to say that when you endurance train, you get a reduction in your resting heart rate. So if your resting heart rate is still, you know, if you're a young person and your resting heart rate is 52 or something, 53, 54, something like that, isn't it fair to say that you could probably reduce that? You know, right? endurance trained people, they usually have resting heart rates of, I don't know, mid 40s or less. I used yeah. to be 36. I had actually had someone I went out with, their resting heart rate was 32. So, you know, if your resting heart rate is 50 or 46 or something like that, isn't it fair to say you probably haven't, reached your you know your increased stroke volume you could probably increase your stroke volume by more and therefore reduce your heart rate and that should increase your vo to max yeah that could be actually you can have a very low heart rate at rest you have a big heart so so it is an indirect indicator of if your heart has increased probably or not but actually it's also given information about uh, parasympathetic activation and uh, there are some researchers nowadays that they think that uh, the parasympathetic system is having a role in increasing the performance of the heart with training. So, so maybe, so maybe there is room for enhancing your parasympathetic adaptation to training. That would be hard to do. Yeah, yeah. There, this yeah. is. Uh, this is going through the cutting edge of a science. Yes, to cutting to, edge. What to try to answer this question? That's very interesting. All right, now I got I got one more here on Twitter. Sean, are the hypothermia induced increases in ventilation enough to reduce muscle blood flow, such as what you see when you experimentally increase the work of breathing and measure leg vascular conductance, so the ability of the leg to, to deliver blood. So, so in theory, in theory, if you increase ventilation, you increase oxygen demand in the respiratory muscles. And, and according to some experiments performed with uh, artificial ventilation during exercise by your own Dempsey and uh, co-workers. So it has been shown that uh, when there is competition between the respiratory muscle and the locomotor muscles, the priority is given to the respiratory muscles. So in theory, mm -hmm. this could contribute to reduce uh, leg blood flow. Another issue is that uh, is that the increase is relevant enough to produce a reduction that can be picked up with uh, the measuring systems that we have today. So I would expect that the reduction is very small. The reduction in uh, in leg blood flow caused okay. by respiratory uh, muscle work, but it may influence because there It'll is be another factor here that is that when you have a uh, heat stress, you need to divert part of the flow to the skin and then the blood pressure is also a little bit lower, the perfusion pressure is lower and all those factors combine and this may reduce uh, uh, locomotor uh, blood flow and oxygen delivery. Right. All right. Well, this is, uh, I actually have more things I want to ask you about, but I think we're, we're getting a pretty long night. Might have to get you back on another time. Um, I'm just looking at some of the other research, because what I quite often do is say, okay, what, what other stuff have you 
been doing lately and you've got a whole bunch of stuff but i think we might just have to get you back on another time or something because we've had a good chat about um regulation of vo2 max and uh limitations so what what i might do though is i might just ask you one thing i like to do is ask about sort of controversies in the field but also so it's another one i've started thinking about lately is a large part of the reason I, I I started doing inside exercises. I wanted I want people to get their information from the experts on exercise research, rather than from influencers. So one question I've decided I'm going to start asking people is is what I want to ask you now. So you know, is there any sort of misinformation or anything out, out there that sort of annoys you that's going around on social media um, that you want to comment comment on? So you sent me through something about uh the use of uh discredit the, the the use of substances acting as vasodilators to explain oxygen delivery etc do you want to just explain that uh, yeah actually because because of, uh, one of the main factors limiting the automats is oxygen delivery so some people say okay if i give a vasodilator i can increase flow if I increase flow, I increase oxygen delivery. But actually, it doesn't work because if you if you inject directly into the femoral artery a vasodilator during exercise, you don't increase leg VO2. Actually, you jeopardize the distribution okay. blood flow between active and less active areas of the muscle and the leg. And the effect is counterproductive. So you have reduced oxygen extraction. So so it doesn't work. So 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 you have the level of vasodilation that is required during exercise. The the only condition where this could work is uh, where you have patients that they have um, reduced leg blood flow or muscle blood flow during exercise due to excessive afferent information from the ergoreceptors. So if you reduce this afferent information, so probably you can attenuate the degree of uh, sympathetic vasoconstriction, and then you could improve uh, uh, leg blood flow in those patients. But the way to go is not to, to inject a vasodilator. Is is to try to minimize the activation of the sympathetic system that that here is seen as a restraining factor. Okay, so, so you were specifically talking about people saying if you take nitrate, which you know has another step, has to go nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide, and that is a dilator, and they're making out like that will increase your VO two max, and you're saying that that will not work like that. Work. And also, it's reducing um, mitochondrial respiration, so it's having a detrimental effect in the mitochondria. That's true. Okay, and then you had controversies. I sent and you sent through something uh, controversies in the field. Intermittent hypoxia. Did you want to talk about that? You were saying there's a bit of a controversy in the field. Yeah, is uh, some people believe that uh, you can increase VO2 max by by uh, by breathing during short periods uh, hypoxia or by putting a mask to train to reduce uh, to put uh, resistance to the to the breathing or to or to create a kind of uh, hypoxia artificially by increasing the dead space when you are breathing those systems they they don't work to increase the automax and and uh, why is that? Is it because there's not enough uh, hypoxic stimulus to increase your red blood cell count, for example? Yeah, you cannot increase uh, hemoglobin concentration because the stimulus is uh, too short. And actually, mm -hmm. you are not acting on the limiting factors. When you're doing exercise in hypoxia, you are not limited by your ventilation or your pulmonary function. So, so overloading your respiratory muscles shouldn't help in a normal person doing exercise at sea level. I it can have influence at altitude and at altitude. Uh, situation. 
All right. Well, thank you very much for this. Um, what I'd like to do is finish up with um, some takeaway messages. So we covered a lot of ground today, but um, what's some takeaway messages you'd like to people to, to pick up from this chat? So I think the most important one is that uh, what, what we have learned for all the experiments we have been involved uh, during the last 30, 40 years is that it's critical to be physically active. When you are physically active, uh, the cardiovascular system works much, much better. And it age differently. It age at a slower pace. So then, then your quality of life is much better. So, so I think that's the most important uh, takeaway message from, from our talk. Yes. Actually, one thing I wanted to say is, so because it's so important, I wanted to get your thoughts on this, just just as a an extra bit related to that, is is this idea that the the VO, your VO two max is the most important determinant of your mortality, so your likelihood of dying in the next five years or whatever. Yeah. Do you want to just expand on that? That fits with what you just said. Well, yes, yes, um, that has been proven in different ways. For example, uh, in the studies where they uh, select mice of a generation to get um, um, mice mating with a high level of VO2 max. So you have uh, uh, offprints that they are having a very high VO2 max. Those ones, they live longer. So, mm -hmm. so it seems that, that if, if you are endowed naturally with a high VO2 max, you probably are likely to live, to live longer, uh, removing all factors of life that can influence. And then, then the other factor that is very important is that the elder you are, the most important is the level of VO2 max as a predictor factor of uh, life expectancy. If you have a chronic disease, the higher the VO2 max, the higher the life expectancy. So, and this is because, because it's because VO2 max measures how your body works integratively when you are pushing it to the maximum. So you are checking how is the engine working, but not only the engine, how the reservoir of uh, fuel is, how is the transfer of fuel to the engine, how is the exhaust working. You are you are looking at the full system. So then having a high VO2 max is, is uh, the best predictor of uh, life expectancy. Fantastic. Well, you convinced me. It's pretty easy to convince me about the importance of exercise, but I think more and more it's becoming, I think people know that exercise is good for us, but I, I, the hard part is to get people to do it. But um, I, okay. Well, thank you again for coming on. Thanks for your time. It's been great. I've learned a lot and uh, I'll see you around. Oh, I have to make my way to the Canary Islands. It's probably more likely I'll see you in Copenhagen actually. Okay. But, uh, so okay. Thank you very much for inviting me. It has been a pleasure to just to talk about uh, things that I have enjoyed studying and, uh, and and doing experiments. And if I have to say something for the audience, I could say that I was a lucky man because I could study what I wanted to study, first thing. And that is because of my parents. And then I was lucky, I'm very lucky, because I had the opportunity to work with friends of things. He was a remarkable man and very good thinker. And uh, and it was very fun and, uh, and very encouraging and inspiring to work with him. So if Absolutely. you want to do a career in research, try to get close to good, to good researchers. Yes. I actually saw, I, I see, I, I know you don't have your own Twitter account, but you have your lab's Twitter account, but you might, might see, I sent an, a tweet a couple of weeks ago about how where I'm sitting here is about 40 meters from the Bank Saltine seminar room. And it has some nice pictures of him up there. And I sent a tweet out and I said, it's very important for the young students to know about these legends, you know, that not forget these people like Bank Saltine and other legends. And we're in the August Krogh building here. So, you know, right back to the 1920s. Um, Copenhagen was very strong in exercise science. I'm glad you got to work with him so much. Okay, okay. well, thanks again. See you.
Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.